Can you hear me well? Anyone? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, Thanks. Super. Okay. Uh, well, hello everyone, and welcome to the first lecture of our early sessions series. This time entitled Money Talks, uh, where we will explore the architecture and territories associated with storing, trading, and management of money. From the history of the Bank of England and the development of London's financial district to the competition for a new commodity exchange in Amsterdam and the design of banknotes. Today, we kick off the series with a lecture on the Bank of, Bank of England by Daniel Aronson. Daniel is a professor of architectural history and director of architectural studies at Boston University. He is the author of three books Obsolescence on Architectural History, Built in the Bank of England, Money Architecture Society and Skyscraper Rivals, the AIG Building and the Architecture of Wall Street. He is also co-editor of Writing Architectural History, Evidence and Narrative in the 21st Century, and Governing by Design, Architecture, Economy, and Politics in the 20th Century, both with the Aggregate Architectural History Collaborative, of which he's also a founding director. His current work relates to the architecture of American government centers, citizenship, state, and capitalism since the 1900s. We look forward to your lecture, Daniel, and to the uh, conversation afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good, great. Um, I'm very sorry not to be able to be with you in person, but I'm looking forward to sharing um, this information and interpretation analysis of the Bank of England's architecture with you, and especially to the conversation afterwards, um, and to hear your thoughts about this material um, and about money and building in general. Um, I'm going to start to share my screen now. Can you hear me and see my screen okay? Yeah. Okay, great. So um, I chose to title this talk today, Mediating Money, because I wanted to focus on this idea of mediation and money and architecture. And I mean mediation in two ways. One mediation as an intermediary, that is to always think about money as an intermediary 
in social relations between people. And I think we can see that in this image from 1859, a painting of one of what's called Dividend Day at the Bank of England, where people who own stock in the Bank of England itself would come to the bank uh, to pick up their dividends. Um, and the transact money transactions then are always uh, intermediaries uh, between individuals. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see a broker um, talking to some women uh, who would be bank stockholders. And also intermediaries, uh, money is an intermediary between people and institutions as we can see on the left where another bank stockholder um, is uh, receiving his dividends from the bank itself. Um, so uh, architecture, of course, not just money, uh, is uh, mediation. Uh, it fashions and structures our relationships between each other. So um, we can think about both money and architecture as instruments of social mediation. But mediation also has a second related definition, which is conciliation. That is to mediate is to smooth over differences. So I also wanna think about the Bank of England's architecture as both purposefully and unintentionally smoothing over conflicts, tensions, and contradictions within the world of money uh, between um, the state and private business, uh, between people's percep Britain's perceptions of paper money and capitalism um, and their relationship to the Bank of England. So mediation, both in terms of an intermediary and mediation in terms of conciliation. So I'll start with the founding of the Bank of England um, in the year 1694 which was six years after William of Orange uh, from the Netherlands was placed on the throne of England um, in order to secure the Protestant succession um, rather than uh, the monarchy uh, being held by Catholics. Um, so uh, during much of William's reign, uh, England was at war with France order to raise funds for these wars, um, uh, William had to come up with certain creative public financing schemes. He could only raise so much money from Parliament because Parliament was jealous of its authority and power, and in Britain did not want to fund an absolute centralist state. And uh, so William and had to find alternate sources of funding uh, rather than through direct taxation um, uh, or other uh, traditional means. So uh, William, uh, with his central government in the west of London, had to, as uh, was traditional in England, turn to the financial center, to private merchants and bankers to raise money. And so in 1694, Parliament was willing to pass a bill, a charter authorizing the creation of a new private bank in the city of London called the Bank of England. And the Bank of England would serve two very distinct and in some ways contradictory purposes. One, the idea was that the bank would raise a certain amount of money, a little more than a million pounds, if I remember correctly. And that bank stock would be lent to the government. So this was the way that uh, William could fund his wars. In return, uh, the government would promise uh, securing through its taxation to secure that loan and pay the interest of it. But also what that raising of bank stock in the Bank of England allowed those, these group of merchants to do in London was to establish a bank to serve their own purposes. That is, they needed a bank uh, to provide them with commercial lending, commercial discount, commercial banking functions. So the Bank of England, when it was founded, 
was both a public was both a public institution that is uh, both a contributing to the national debt and managing the national debt, and also a private uh, merchant or commercial bank. The bankers, the merchants who helped to found the Bank of England were men like Sir Gilbert Heathcote. What's important to realize about the Bank of England's founders were that these men were outsiders in the city of London. They were not organized in some of the main mercantile companies like the Royal African Company um, and the East India Company. Instead, these men, though they were wealthy for outsiders, many of them were nonconformists. That is, religiously, they stood outside the Bank of England establishment. And many of them uh, were only recent immigrants to England. That is, uh, they were, uh, many of them uh, had Dutch, recent Dutch ancestry, or what were called Huguenots. That is, they were Prot from Protestant families that had been expelled from France. And so these men wanted to set up a financial institution for themselves um, uh, as a counterweight to the dominant uh, mercantile um, and capitalist interests in the city of London. So when the Bank of England was founded, one way to understand it was that it was an expedient uh, for that moment in 1694 to help raise money for wars against France. And also the Bank of England was a surrogate for the national government, but also uh, was private. And the Bank of England therefore had two dual allegiances one was to its own private interests among this group of uh, wealthy overseas merchants. Um, and the other one was in allegiance to the state. And so the bank always had this compound composite character, public and private. The bank's uh, founders didn't know how long they would be in existence for. They had a 40 year charter or so. Um, and so at first, for 40 years, they did not occupy their own quarters. Rather, they rented out the, a hall belonging to a livery company in the city of London. Livery companies were groups um, that had first been organized uh, by profession. So for example, groups of grocers or goldsmiths. And there were these old medieval halls throughout London, oftentimes set back in courtyards. So if you can see my cursor in the upper left, the grocer's hall was down an alley off poultry in a secluded courtyard. So the Bank of England from about 1694 to 1734 occupied um, uh, this space, a livery company hall. Um, uh, back when I was working on this project, I had a couple of students uh, recreate a plan of the grocer's hall based on the contract for its lease between the Bank of England. So the bank, the grocer's hall was more or less divided into three main parts. Uh, you would enter in through um, the doorway you see on the right. The main part of the bank was the livery company hall, this double height hall that you see on the left. This was where the main bank transactions would take place. So if you were a merchant uh, and you were coming in and you wanted to deposit money, withdraw money, um, you would do so in what uh, the Great Hall. So this was where the private banking functions would take place. Uh, the public banking functions, that is where the national debt would have been managed, that is where the ledgers were kept and the dividends were kept, we're in the, two, the several store uh, groups of rooms to the right here. And in some ways that's what we see take placing, taking place in um, uh, the image on the right, which is basically an accounting function uh, where that national debt was being managed where people might receive their dividends, but not really much happening on a day-to-day -day basis. The third major part of uh, the Bank of England in this time was where the directors themselves would meet. And this was where um, originally the members of the grocer's hall would meet in their court of directors. So there might be a one large courtroom and then smaller committee rooms behind it. So you have private banking, 
Uh, that is, even though these are large public functions, commercial banking, government banking, and the management of the bank. The other uh, feature of livery halls often was that they would have secluded gardens behind there. So there's a sense then of a kind of a privacy, um, a sense um, of a kind of an elite identity. So um, what characterized the Bank of England at this time uh, was a quality of seclusion, um, uh, being hidden from the public, and in some ways, this was appropriate because the Bank of England was a very controversial institution at this time, um, and there was no desire or real reason either to have its own permanent quarters um, or to make much of a public display on the street. So I want to talk for a few minutes about what made the Bank of England controversial during this time and a precarious institution that was unsure of its long-term future. First of all, the idea of a national debt itself was very controversial. Um, in this image uh, from, uh, by William Hogarth called The Lottery, it talks about down below, upon the pedestal is national credit that is up here, leaning on the pillar of all the debt that was being um, uh, created for the national government. And this debt was held uh, by the creditors, many of them Bank of England stockholders. And it was felt that um, this was not a secure basis for national finances or for Britain's national identity, in part because as I mentioned before, the founders of the Bank of England, many of them were what were perceived as foreigners as nonconformists, as people from the Netherlands or from France. And the feeling then, and many of the subsequent um, uh, national debt holders, because of course the British government didn't just need that initial loan when the Bank of England was founded, but as the wars went on, it kept on raising more and more funds through the Bank of England. The people who bought those annuities or that credit in these early years were often people from, they were often Dutch, they were often foreigners. So the feeling was that the British national, the English national government was literally indebted to foreigners and nonconformists. And this was a very precarious position. So there was a great deal of resistance among, for example, the landed interests who didn't trust these merchants and these financiers. They felt that debt was a very insubstantial and precarious basis for the national wealth. They believed instead, for example, that the national wealth should be based um, on land instead. So the whole idea, the kind of the passions, the mental anguish, the uncertainty, the chaos that you're seeing here down below, which was felt to be what national debt was about, was actually not a very firm foundation uh, for the British government. So this was, uh, there were repeated attempts in the early 18th century to pay off the national debt, which of course for the creditors themselves, they didn't want that to happen because it was a very uh, sound investment for them. Now, the controversy over the national debt came to a head in what was called the South Sea Scheme in the mid 18th century, or what you may know as the South Sea Bubble. As an alternate to the Bank of England, the Conservative Party in the British uh, Parliament, the Tory um, uh, government, um, uh, opened up, uh, uh, founded a new company called, called the South Sea Company to hold um, national debt. Um, and the South Sea Company's finances and basis was also supposed to be on these kind of, it granted them a right uh, for a monopoly for trading in um, the Caribbean. A lot of people invested in the South Sea Company, believing that it was a good, strong investment. Uh, it created this uh, stock bubble. Again, William Hogarth in an image of the South Sea scheme, talking about the wild ride that investors were on, uh, a great number of Britons invested in the South Sea scheme. And as you know, uh, the bubble burst. Um, uh, so this was seen as speculation run amok. Uh, 
Um, and uh, again, uh, the Bank of England was directly threatened by the South Sea scheme because the South Sea Company was meant to be a rival to the Bank of England. Uh, the national debt, City of London merchants were also seen as culturally corrupting Britain. Again, another William Hogarth uh, image shows a marriage, literally a marriage contract between a British merchant and uh, landed gentry. Um, uh, who And the landed uh, merchant, uh, the landed gentry, the nobleman, who has wasted all his money on architectural patronage and showing very poor taste doing it. Notice that this building in the back is, is poorly designed and classically because it has a column in the middle instead of an even number of columns, is basically uh, selling off his son to the daughter of this merchant so that the merchant can marry into the aristocracy and uh, the landed nobleman can have some funds to waste on uh, architecture. And so this was also seen as corrupting, uh, finan uh, city finances were seen as corrupting um, uh, the social hierarchy. So again, this idea that money is a form of social mediation here as a form of corruption uh, between the moneyed interests and the traditional landed interests. So considering all this, we can understand uh, why the Bank of England directors wanted to maintain a low profile. They were unsure of the long-term um, viability of the Bank of England, and they were constantly worried about um, literal, so oftentimes physical attacks against their um, bank and other interests in the city. Another dimension of uh, the Bank of England's precarity had to do with the fact that the stock of the Bank of England, like other stock, could be traded. That is, it was a liquid investment. This was what made it appealing. That is, if you wanted to trade your bank stock or other stock you held in the national debt, you would go to a part of England called the part of the city of London called Exchange Alley, Change Alley, and you would walk through Change Alley. And you might find, or you would better yet hire a broker to find for you someone to buy your stock. And then you would retire to one of the many coffee houses in Change Alley and finish the business. Then you would have to go to the Bank of England itself to get that transfer registered. So Change Alley was seen as the site of this kind of frenzied trading in credit and debt and paper money. And it was a labyrinthine, strange, unusual space in London. And it contrasted with the Royal Exchange. The Royal Exchange, which was built just to the left here, as you know, in the late 17th century, was not a stock exchange, but was a commodities exchange. So physical material objects would be traded there. Its architecture was an architecture of regularity, of uniformity, and of apparent rationality. It was also a closed space so that not just anyone could wander about, but only merchants were allowed in there to conduct transactions that were perceived as being more open, tra transparent, and honest as opposed to the chaotic trading in money as debt, as credit, as speculation in the labyrinthine and chaotic change alley. Now, after the South Sea bubble, one of the consequences was that the Bank of England consolidated its control over the national debt. And all of the kind of contestation about that in the first 40 years of the Bank of England's existence uh, tended um, to drop away. What happened in the 1720s then in terms of this kind of um, subsidence and the controversy about the national debt was that the South Sea Company and the East India Company, two of the Bank of England's rivals for managing the national debt um, uh, built 
corporate headquarters for themselves in the city of London. So you see the South Sea Company building its in the 1720s and also the East India Company. But the Bank of England still did not yet have its own um, building. The directors were split. There was an unusual vote uh, that's recorded in the Bank of England between older directors of the Bank of England not wanting to build their own building and wanting to continue to rent. Perhaps they thought that it was a waste of their capital to build a building. And they might also have been the early directors were more insecure about the bank's position. But the younger directors won the vote. And so the Bank of England constructed its first building. And they held a competition to do so. And fortunately, we have uh, the other competition entries. Um, they hired a local... Uh, first of all, they secured a site. The Grocers Hall is here to the west of the Royal Exchange. The South Sea Company uh, constructed their building here. The East India Company building was here. Change Alley is here. The Bank of England secured uh, a site here. You can see in this image, the bank building is built. So the Bank of England located itself and tightened up the emerging financial district in the city of London. The building, uh, the competition entry winning design was by a local city of London surveyor named George Sampson. He designed this building in a fairly sophisticated classical style that would have recalled the architecture of Inigo Jones. This is a very different building than the types of medieval buildings that were largely found in the Bank of England. Uh, Samson's design in many ways regularized and repeated the grocer's hall design. We can see that it, Samson's building is organized around a pay hall. And it widely divides and it divided uh, the public uh, functions that is in the front of the building is where bank stock would be transferred. So this is the market function of the building in the trading in bank stock. The private, uh, the commercial banking function took place in the Great Hall. And the administration of the bank took in place in the rear. And so the kind of the friend, the, the tr market functions, which were the ones that were considered um, the more suspicious, that is involving speculation, were widely separated from the administrative functions that were about the bank's integrity. In the middle was the pay hall and the director's room was right behind. So that same division between great hall with the director's suite next to it and the transfer of stock, uh, those separation took place um, and then with the courtyard in between. The pay hall uh, was that central area and we can think about this view of the pay hall. It's actually an early 18th century view of the site of the mediation, the social mediation across these counters of people. Uh, and now again, these are, it's the commercial business coming in and um, transacting their banking business um, here in the center. Arguably, the Bank of England's building is the first purpose-built bank um, in the world. Banking, of course, would take place elsewhere, but generally in adapted uh, rooms. Now, one of the interesting features of the Bank of England's architecture here at this point was the degree to which it tried to establish itself, even though it was a private bank, as a national institution. We notice a statue here of William III, the founder of England, uh, the founder of the Bank of England. So even though this is a private bank, the idea that it might somehow have to do with the government is indicated um, by the statue of um, uh, William III. There is also in the pediment above the pay hall, a sculpture of Britannia, the allegorical symbol of England. And the street facing facade of the Bank of England borrowed from an image of the Queen's Gallery at Somerset House. So a royal resident further down the river 
You can see the arcaded, rusticated basement uh, with a row of pilasters up above. This building was believed to have been designed by Inigo Jones, um, uh, that great um, uh, exemplar of British national classicism. So the Bank of England here in several ways is architecturally expressing itself as um, a national institution. Uh, its facade onto Threadneedle Street, um, on the one hand, it appears very different than the types of architecture that you would see around it, the older um, houses, the medieval architecture there with this classical appearance. So again, standing out um, from the city, but at the same time, there's a certain kind of domestic scale uh, to the building and a sense, still a sense of seclusion uh, in the back here. The building, therefore, uh, Samson's building, uh, has a very uh, different uh, uh, relationship. It both mediates um, the new institution with the city of London. His building still in some ways has a domestic scale, even though it stands out. Um, and it attempts to conciliate the Bank of England in that regard by presenting itself not as a private institution, only looking out for its own interests, but also somehow with a public character, almost like a triumphal arch on the front, that Jonesian classicism, the iconography of uh, Britain as well. But of course, it's not a public institution. It remains constitutionally a private institution. And it also, in this classicism, uh, with that tries to lock in all that chaos of the market into a rigid, rational design uh, that is centralized in a classical form. It looks like a completed building. It masks the essential dynamism of capitalism, which is always about growth and change. So in this way, uh, we can see the building is ideological, appearing public when it's actually private, appearing national when it's private, and appearing static uh, as opposed to a dynamic uh, speculative capitalism. Uh, so in that regard, then, looking at the Bank of England, uh, it represents the end of that period of precarity, but also an architecture that through its rationalistic, uh, rigid classicism, uh, in some ways is meant to make uh, to kind of, um, uh, to be a response to the apparent chaos, irregularity, um, uh, and emotionalism uh, that the Bank of England's critics and the critics of the national debt and paper money had perceived in the first 40 years of the Bank of England's existence. Now, in subsequent years, as you can see in the growth of the national debt, that, that um, the, uh, British government continued to have to borrow more and more from, city, from the city of London uh, as an intermediary. And with the growth of the national debt, the Bank of England had to grow because there was more um, uh, administrative work to do, um, uh, more off back, off back office clerical work um, to do. Also, as the national debt grew, it meant that the bank's capitalization grew and therefore its private commercial um, banking business could also increase. So the Bank of England had to expand beyond its central block here. And the man uh, who was hired to do this was a man from the city of London named Robert Taylor, um, who was the Bank of England's official uh, bank uh, architect from 1764 to 1788. At, at first, uh, uh, East Wing was constructed with a set of four transfer offices. Transfer meaning this would be the place you would go uh, once you had um, uh, agreed to a trade in government debt or bank stock. And you would go here um, and you would there would be counters ranged between the columns. And you would go and you would ask a clerk to register a transfer uh, a sale and a purchase of your bank stock. So these are these four transfer offices, a columnar hall, 
Um, the building uh, in order um, uh, had no windows, uh, so it was top lit. This was an effort probably both for fire protection and security, physical security. And in some ways, what Robert Taylor did was that this is the first uh, purpose-built bank hall. It establishes that type of the bank hall as a columnar hall. Now, in the center of those four transfer offices, you can see here is called the Brokers Exchange. So instead of meeting in Change Alley out of doors and going to a coffee house, the Bank of England provided what was also arguably the first stock exchange. Again, not a commodities exchange like the Royal Exchange, but the first stock exchange. Taylor, a well-educated classical architect, based this uh, circular space to maximize transaction possibilities, a market um, on the rotunda, uh, on the Pantheon in Rome. And here's a later view of that broker's exchange. So that kind of frenzied activity that one imagines among stockbrokers, or you could just walk in as a, a private shareholder and to try to find a buyer um, uh, or a seller uh, for stock. And then you would go into one of the transfer offices um, and register your transaction officially. The, uh, the other part of uh, the bank that Taylor expended is a very important part because in some ways it's not, what's most important about the bank's wealth is that it's registered in ledgers. So I think we think of money in different ways as coins or paper money or securities. But in some ways, I think that the bank's true wealth and what had to be protected was the records of uh, its transactions and its accounts. And this was held back in the library in a multi-story fireproof building. The most important part of the building that actually probably had to be protected was not the gold that it held, but the paper records, its paper financial records, because without those being kept safe, there could be ultimately no trust in the bank. The other part of the bank that Sohn expanded was the courtroom. Remember the courtroom and the committee rooms in Samson's building had been directly behind the hall here. Now they're still adjacent to the hall, but more secluded. So again, architecture as social mediation as intermediary. The, the directors now are more separated, especially separated from the crazy chaos of the market over here. And they uh, have a very elegant private courtroom for themselves, um, uh, separated from them, especially from the market function of the bank to the east. Uh, on the facade of the Bank of England, Taylor created this windowless and very sophisticated and actually cosmopolitan design. If Samson's building had looked like British Jonesian classicism, the design here on the right looked more like something that you would find in France or even Italy. It was based on Bramante's Belvedere Courtyard and the pairing of columns on either side here would have, rep would have looked like something that you would see for example, the Place de la Concorde. So this was a very actually alien kind of European continental design that uh, Taylor added to the Bank of England's uh, East Wing, a uh, West uh, East Wing at that time. The Bank of England was not just expanding contiguously and demolishing and replacing older residences and business uh, in this part of London, but it also developed its own private uh, commercial develop real estate development for uh, business offices across the street. These bank buildings here in front of the Royal Exchange and Taylor designed these as well. So the Bank of England was actually an active real estate developer in the, uh, in the evolution of the city of London, really changing the city of London from what had been a mixed use residential um, uh, area uh, with lots of small businesses, commodity, uh, different types of retail and trade to becoming what we think of of the city of London now, which is a financial center. Now this type of change did not go without opposition. In 1780, across London, there were what were called the Gordon Riots. These were mainly anti-Catholic riots Catholics were perceived as foreigners. And remember the Bank of England had been perceived as a foreign institution. 
The most spectacular event in the Gordon riots that went on for several days was the burning of Newgate Prison. But the Bank of England was also attacked at this time. And we see this rioter, no popery, that is, again, anti-Catholic, the Newgate reformer. But what he is uh, screaming here is down with the bank. The Bank of England uh, had to be defended by troops uh, from the British government, uh, from the central government at this time. After the riot, the British, the Bank of England, uh, actually a British army officer drew this plan. And you can see that what he's envisioning is a new perimeter for the Bank of England uh, with guard towers on the corners here as well. So the Bank of England had to be secured. What ended up happening was that a whole new West Wing was built so that the bank would be isolated and that church was taken uh, um, against its parishioner's wishes to make the bank more secure and also to continue to expand it as it had more business. Taylor designed a new type of uh, bank office, the reduced annuities office here. Um, in consultation with the staff as well. So again, thinking about architecture as social mediation, the staff had complained that this space was not well lit with all these smaller domes. Um, and so the directors of the bank listened to their staff um, and created a, uh, and Taylor designed a better top lit space here. Okay, the next architect and perhaps the best known architect of the Bank of England um, was uh, Sir John Soane. Um, in many ways, all, what Soane did, even though he's the best known, is he merely continued what Taylor had done. That is, uh, Taylor had been the one who had uh, made the building uh, really an urban scaled structure, isolated from the rest of the city of London. Uh, Taylor was also the one who um, was the first to think about how to design a columned bank hall, a top-lit columned bank hall. And, uh, but Taylor's uh, building, Taylor's structures were mainly made of wood um, and uh, they were decaying after a short number of years. So Soane had an opportunity uh, to start to replace some of those East Wing transfer offices. So here is his well-known bank stock office. Uh, in a reduced classical style, designed in uh, with his George Dance, and an adaptation of that toplet um, reduced annuity all office of Taylor's. Soane also uh, rebuilt the rotunda or the stock exchange in the center of the East Wing. But he also added to the building here to the Northeast, including a new courtyard uh, for which was called um, uh, the Bullion uh, Yard towards here. This was where the gold itself would come in on and out of the building. It was a service entrance, um, so a very private entrance and a back entrance, but Soane took the opportunity to create this great triumphal arch on the interior of the bank, um, even though it wouldn't be seen uh, very frequently. Eventually, Soane also uh, extended the building to the Northwest so that it became what it is today, a completely isolated site in the city of London. Where this is the old Threadneedle Street here to the front, and now uh, Soane extended it to the Northwest, creating a completely windowless enclosure. One of the major spaces that Soane built is this block here. This is a large clerical workspace a large white collar workspace um, for registering a revolutionary innovation, which was new low denomination notes at low as two pounds. When the Bank of England had first been founded and through really all the time that Samson work and Taylor's work, the only people who used banknotes uh, were uh, merchants. The smallest banknote was maybe about 50 or 100 pounds which would have been a clerk's annual salary. So people did not walk around with paper money for most of the 18th century. But during the Napoleonic, the French and Napoleonic Wars in the late 18th century, um, uh, there wasn't enough gold and silver 
So the Bank of England started to have to issue low denomination notes for the first time then in the late 18th and, and, the, and early 19th century, ordinary people started to have access to paper money. And this was at first very uh, unsettling because they were used to having metal in their pockets. Um, but the Bank of England was one of many banks then that was issuing notes and they needed more clerks uh, to keep track of each of these notes, to fill them in, to write them out uh, and to keep track of them. So the Bank of England was expanding in that way, putting paper money into people's pockets so the first, for the first time, many people were actually having Bank of England money in their pockets, not just merchants in the city of London, but uh, Londoners in general and Britons. Uh, uh, so the Bank of England itself was becoming um, what we might think of as a more populist institution. So to link all these areas together, design these corridors, he's well, he's well known for these interstitial spaces that co create these kind of picturesque aesthetic experiences, in some ways aestheticizing and distracting uh, from the rationality of the institution. So also um, uh, toward the end of uh, his time as bank architect in the 1820s, um, as the exterior of Taylor's building decayed, um, uh, created a whole new uh, wall around it. Um, and so this was one of Soane's last jobs, which was to uh, re-encase the Bank of England. This is the front towards Threadneedle Street. The main entrance into the building uh, is here. The entrance into the market functions is off to the side here. So those were always carefully kept separate. You entered the market here, but to actually conduct what we think of as banking, you would have gone in uh, to the front. And then with Soane's expansion, there were other private entrances through here to get to the director's office and then kind of the service entrance to the back. Curiously, the most spectacular uh, architectural confection was not towards the front of the building along Threadneedle Street, but Zone built it uh, in a blank wall of the Northwest angle that he called the Tivoli Corner because it was based on the Roman orders at the Temple of Tivoli. So this is a very curious that Zone would put really the grandest architectural feature where there is no entrance into the bank all the way around the corner from the main entrance, it's up here. But in this design by uh, Zone's um, uh, older colleague and teacher, George Dance, it was envisioned in the early 19th century that there would be this large redevelopment to the north of London towards uh, Finsbury Square, driving two large new avenues from this new residential development down towards the Royal Exchange. And this Main Street Moorgate was going to come down to the northwest corner of the Bank of England. This was never built, but it explains the grandeur of the Tivoli Corner because so new that, or that it was intended that this be at the end of a large uh, axis. The point that I wanna raise here is that the Bank of England really was becoming an urban node in the city of London. It was almost as large in terms of occupying area, three acres as St. Paul's Cathedral, much larger than the Royal Exchange or the Mansion House, um, the center of town government. So the Bank of England was becoming uh, physically the center of the city of London and the Tivoli Corner is an expression of an idea that that's what um, uh, would end up happening even though it, uh, that was not realized. Now, I wanna talk about money as social mediation because it was not, uh, it's, it was not neutral at this time um, socially. With the rise of all these two pound notes and people having a lot of opportunities then to use them, there was uh, more forgery. And the punishment for carrying a forged note was hanging. So even if you accidentally took a forged Bank of England note, you potentially could suffer uh, the punish capital punishment from it. And there was a great deal of protest because that seemed very unfair. That is two pounds wasn't a lot of money, but you could get up being hanged about it. So I wanna emphasize here that uh, our money can be a form of social mediation, um, not as an abstraction, but about political power between the bankers 
Um, in effect, it was seen as um, uh, exploiting um, uh, and um, uh, an injustice being done to commoners who might only accidentally have forged notes. Now, what else happened during the, during the French and Napoleonic Wars was that the Bank of England became a tourist attraction. This was unexpected and unintentional. At first, it was uh, illustrious visitors. So when um, uh, the Tsar of Russia came and wanted to see where uh, the bank, where the British government was raising all its money from, he was taken on a tour um, of the Bank of England. Members of the British royal family were taken on tours to try to understand how this national institution worked. The Bank of England uh, was illuminated, that is lit up for national celebrations at this time, uh, as if it was a national institution. And uh, people started to visit it. It was listed in tourist guides. And there was a book uh, called The Tour of Dr. Syntax, a fictional book imagining a kind of a provincial cleric visiting the sites in London. And here's an illustration of it. So the Bank of England was actually opened up to popular tourism. You could just walk in. People were curious to see where the gold came from, where the paper notes came from. And this tourism of the Bank of England then made it appear as a, more as a national institution and also created a sense of uh, public ownership um, to the bank as well. In some ways to uh, encapsulate uh, what the Bank of England had become by this time, we can take a look at this fantastical aerial cutaway perspective that was done for John Soane by uh, the renderer, Joseph Michael Gandhi. It shows the Bank of England uh, as a monumental Roman ruin. So in some ways then uh, aggrandizing uh, Soane's achievement, even though Soane was not the author of the whole Bank of England. Um, again, the middle part still was by Samson. The courtrooms were still tailors, but Soane had done much of the rest here. Now, on the one hand, uh, we can think that perhaps the Bank of England directors wouldn't be so happy with the public exhibition at the Royal Academy of this as their institution in ruins. But in some ways, it spoke to the idea, one, that this would someday be as grand an institution as an ancient Roman one. But also the Bank of England's directors were very secure at this time. There was a renewal of the Bank Charter Act in 1833 that in effect meant the Bank of England had become the de facto central bank for the country. The word central bank was first invented in 1830. That mean it was responsible for the national monetary system. Uh, it was a lender of last resort if other banks ran into trouble. Uh, the stockbrokers were banished from the rotunda at this time, even though stock would still be transferred here. Um, and so the bank was no longer part of that chaotic market. Um, the bank's paper money became the one legal tender in Britain. And there was more um, uh, parliamentary oversight of the Bank of England. So the Bank of England, even though it was still a private corporation uh, profiting from its business was perceived now um, as a national institution. Um, and uh, the bank became mythic in many ways. It was there still a common expression uh, in England to say something is as safe as the Bank of England. That is an investment in bank stock was considered very safe. Charitable corporations, widowers, uh, all the people here felt that the bank was a safe place to invest. And so that's what they've come to in Dividend Day. The Bank of England would be a site then for a gathering of all of different types of Londoners um, at uh, this time. Um, so all of that early controversy about the Bank of England's, the social character of its directors, um, suspicion of paper money and the national debt, all of that um, had faded away. In the early uh, 20th century, then the Bank of England architecturally, nothing really much changed. There were some interior renovations, 
but basically it was a period in the from the 1830s to the early 20th centuries really of hibernation or somnolence, nothing much happening. We see a view of the Bank of England with the Royal Exchange here, the Bank of England um, as the center for the city, the center for uh, London finance, the center for um, national finance as well. World War I, however, as wars always did, increased the national debt and uh, the Bank of England, um, which up to this point had only about a thousand employees inside, uh, quadrupled in size. And so it was necessary to increase the building. Uh, the Bank of England directors asked for proposals for how to do this. Uh, their, their clerk of works, their architects named Francis Troop, Imagine kind of building a high rise commercial building, uh, lots of windows uh, here looking like an office building um, and also punching holes in sewn screen wall around the side here. This was considered too commercial that even though the Bank of England was still a commercial bank, it saw itself as a public, a governmental public institution and didn't want to uh, simply appear to have a functional office building. So a well-known architect, one of the two leading architects in Britain at this time, along with Edwin Lutyens, Herbert Baker, who was working uh, to design the capital of New Delhi, um, uh, was called in to design the Bank of England. Uh, everything inside of the screen walls was demolished. And here we see uh, Stone's transfer offices um, being taken down in the, 18, in the 1920s. The screen wall was retained, but inside it, a whole new structure uh, was built uh, and designed by Baker up to 1942. Baker basically uh, enlarged and regularized, but kept the Bank of England's older form. There had been since Taylor's West Wing, a garden court on this site, and that garden court now is placed front and center. So again, that sense of seclu elite seclusion in the middle of the city of London. Along the south and east edges, uh, in a preservationist sentiment, Baker uh, rebuilt the own halls, but now extended out to house all this clerical work. The Bank of England was no longer a place that the public went into. It was really all about back office administrative functions by this time. The courtroom was recreated, facing out over the garden court at the center of the building. In some ways where it had been in Samson's building behind a courtyard in the middle of the complex. But of course the building was also very modern too. So as much as it tried to reenact tradition, uh, it was uh, constructed largely out of steel, modern mechanical, equipment and an up-to-date uh, management structure for the thousands of people now working in it. So the Bank of England in some ways uh, had both evolved from its precarious beginnings and its composite character in some ways more beholden to its private shareholders to a more public institution, but in some ways it had retained much of its architectural and cultural character shielded from the city, organized around a garden court um, as it had been in the past with the director's uh, elite status reinforced in their parlor suites. Uh, Samson's uh, building uh, had shown the Bank of England beginning to emerge, um, uh, creating more of a public national identity for itself, uh, or, uh, and as a active site of mediation, uh, intermediary between people and the banking industry. Robert Taylor had expanded controversially the building onto an urban site, um, had brought in the stockbrokers into the building itself. And this was probably the height of the Bank of England's public interface um, with the city. Uh, Soane's Bank of England in some ways was the period of the bank's conciliation and the architecture's inadvertent use as a tourist attraction um, so that Britons finally became comfortable with paper money um, and the national debt and saw it more as a curiosity 
and a source of security uh, rather than a threat. What of the Bank of England today then? And I'll conclude uh, here. Um, uh, the Bank of England uh, has not changed uh, architecturally, um, certainly not externally uh, since bank, uh, the completion of it by Baker in the 1940s. It is now a grade uh, one listed building. So it in some ways will never, uh, and certainly no anticipation that it will change. Um, functionally, uh, the Bank of England uh, continues to serve as Britain's central bank. It was nationalized in 1946. Um, and uh, so was no, no longer at all operating uh, at, for its own private interests or as a private uh, commercial bank. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that architecture has no role whatsoever to play anymore in mediating between the institution uh, and the British public. In the 1980s, the Soane's Bank Stock Office was recreated in the East Wing as part of a new museum for the Bank of England so that the public could come into the building itself and learn something of the Bank of England's history. And on the occasion of the Bank of England's museum receiving its one millionth visitor in 1998-99, the bank governor at that time, Eddie George, um, uh, said that to explain the value of the museum and of the recreated bank stock office, he said, we're not just concerned with in, uh, inflation, but with growth and unemployment. We're nice people, you know. The idea here is that there still is, of course, susp popular suspicion of central bank monetary policy, taking sides socially over uh, moneyed interests over that of the population. So the percent, the idea was, was that the bank stock office recreated would indicate to people who visited that the Bank of England actually cared um, about uh, its public perception. And so just to conclude here, uh, to try to, as you continue your series about architecture and money, to understand architecture and money, both as forms of social mediation, as intermediaries, and also as conciliation. Um, and what architecture uh, and the particular interest here that the Bank of England story tells, I think, is the very tight relationship from the beginning between private capital and the market on the one hand, and the state and the government on the other, constantly up for negotiation, the precariousness of that, the contestation, and the important roles that architecture can play mediating those all those relationships. So I'll finish up here and look forward uh, to your responses. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, I would perhaps advise to come in the front so that you can properly listen to the microphone. Yeah. yeah, yeah, please. Yes. <laughs> so I, I, I was wondering about um, the Baroque um, architecture, the Baroque, the classical. Wasn't that more like um, in, in Florence, for example, there was uh, the Medici and the uh, that, that was also more capitalistic, and they, they, yeah, I, I thought, is it not a very, uh, a very capitalistic style of architecture? That was my question. That, that the broke is, I'm sorry, the that what is a capitalistic style of architecture? Well, uh, you mentioned that during um, uh, they, they built a more classical uh, appearance. Yes. yes. Uh, in the bank uh, at start, 
and then um you said it was in co contrast or uh oh yes with uh with uh with the capitalistic uh nature of the bank oh, oh yes okay what did i mean by that yeah. yeah okay um yeah so what i meant by that at that point was that that or that first building of the bank of england in uh, um, a classical style that is centralized, hierarchical, especially a sense of completion and finish. You know, there's that um, kind of basic definition of kind of a classical composition that Alberti had offered that nothing can be added or taken away, but for the worse, right? That's uh, the idea of a kind of a classical building that it's finished and contained. Uh, to me is uh, kind of contrary to what the essential nature of capitalism is. You know, there's Joseph Schumpeter's definition of capitalism as creative destruction. As constantly unfinished, capitalism obviously requires growth. That is, every capitalist country measures its economic well being um, uh, based on uh, the growth in domestic product products. So to, to image a capitalist institution as classical as finished and contained is to belie the dynamism of uh, um, capitalism itself. That's what I meant by that, which is to uh, appear as if it's finished, complete, harmonious, um, is a way of masking the kind of in, what some people might see as the inherent chaos and unpredictability of capitalism, which it feeds off of constantly seeking new forms of investment and redevelopment. Yes, thank you. Yeah, maybe um, another question is the successors of architects uh, that extended and adapted the building how was their relation towards each other? Were they trying to surpass each other? Were they trying, were they more respectable towards what was already built or what was their relationship? Sure, That's what yeah, I'm sure. Um, uh, they were trying to surpass each other. Um, certainly Taylor's addition uh, were seen as kind of the next and most up-to-date kind of version of classicism. Sohn was openly antagonistic towards Taylor and the documentary evidence. He took every opportunity to say that Taylor's buildings, not just stylistically were poorly designed, but that structurally uh, were very unprofessional, that Taylor uh, had used rubble to build the walls. Uh, that was very insecure. And um, I think probably the architect who was most respectful of his predecessor was, was Baker. Um, Baker really uh, advocated with the Bank of England directors not to demolish sewn screen walls and very much wanted to create, um, you saw those Sony and halls to recreate it. The irony is, is that um, Nicholas Pevsner talked about Baker's rebuilding of the Bank of England as the worst act of vandalism uh, that had occurred uh, in the 20th century. Um, uh, certainly the building was demolished, but uh, it, it couldn't have, the bank as an institution couldn't have continued to function on that site without a rebuilding of it. So to answer your question, Taylor and Sohn uh, were pretty antagonistic towards their predecessors. Um, uh, Baker was probably the one who was the most respectful. And that had to do with the Bank of England director's own views too. I think they saw themselves as kind of gentlemanly capitalists, to use a term, um, uh, whose whole uh, authority and legitimacy was based on tradition, on things like the gold standard and their own um, uh, familial lineage. So it made sense that Baker would be the most respectful. Whereas the early Bank of England directors uh, were more, um, they were radical outsiders, uh, especially Samson and Taylor's Bank of England directors. So they were, and so, and the directors at Sohn's time were really willing to experiment with the new style of architecture and let Sohn do what he wanted to do. Um, whereas the bank directors by the, uh, the 20th century were the most conservative element uh, in British society. Thank you.
Hello. Um, so you you mentioned that uh, the architecture uh, on one side contributes to the creation of a financial class or society, but at the same time, it's a reflection of it. Yes. Could you tell us more about this reciprocal relationship? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, so I mean, literally the Bank of England enables as a building and as an institution, these merchants uh, to build their wealth and create their wealth and to also um, to uh, express themselves culturally. That is very little is known about any of the individual Bank of England directors and cultural activities, especially early on, but one can see in their architectural patronage, their willingness uh, to um, uh, adapt to the cultural elite. So the Bank of England as an institution and as a building literally becomes an instrument for building their wealth and their cultural status. Um, but I also think in turn, uh, it um, also the buildings uh, uh, and the architecture then in the subsequent use creates a certain identity. So that idea of a kind of an elite seclusion and having a garden court in the middle of the center of the city of London further reinforces a certain identity. But I'm also interested in kind of the accidental um, and unintended uses of the buildings and how that the architecture plays. And that, that idea of the Bank of England becoming a tourist attraction uh, and the bank of Eng and the bank director is kind of adapting to it. Um, uh, for example, being asked to lead tours and then to provide information uh, for tourists, um, uh, allowing and allow their building to be decorated on those celebrations as well, um, helps to I think conciliate. That is, let people come to terms with something that's very unfamiliar to them. Uh, but of course, it also created the perception of public ownership of what was still a private corporation. So I always kind of see those two things in tension and never resolved. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yes, thank you. So perhaps a, a follow-up from, from Garu and I on the on the idea of identity. There was something interesting on the Samsung's uh, building that you mentioned that while it was a private bank, it had to represent uh, or look like a public institution. Yes. So I was wondering if besides the statue on the table, I think it was, were there any other traces on the architecture that sure. reflected this? Yes. Uh, whether the chosen materials or, yeah. I don't know, perhaps it looked similar to other public institution uh, yeah. buildings in the city? Yeah. So, uh, there was the statuary, there was the statue of William III in the Pay Hall. There was the statue of Britannia, the allegorical image of Britain over the pediment in the entrance to the Pay Hall. And there was the street front facade elevation uh, of that rusticated arcaded base with the columnar main story uh, that looked like the Queen's Gallery. Um, in Somerset House, that is a royal building that was believed to have been by Inigo Jones. Um, and that also would have associated the bank's architecture with a kind of a British classicism at that time. And all of, especially that street front facade would have stood out differently from the more medieval appearance of buildings in the city of London. So I think Samson's building in that regard had a kind of a civic, and public expression to it, but still the overall scale of the building and coming up to the street and its height, it blended into a certain degree with the city. So I think there was both this effort to um, express a national purpose and not just be a private profit seeking institution, but to do so still in a way that was not too disruptive within the city of London Taylor subsequent building in its scale and style was disruptive. I'm not saying that's why the Gordon rioters attacked it because they recognized the architecture was alien, but that was the direction that the Bank of England went in the mid 18th century was that it became um, uh, an outsized um, uh, it, place within the city of London. Does that answer your question about its uh, national representation? I have no question. 
So um, you mentioned that I think the spatial relationship kind of reflect the social relationship. And yes. then I'm wondering that the kind of the spatial arrangement of Bank of Britain, where is its heritage or what are other siblings of, of this kind of spatial yes. relations yep. that's other than banks? Oh, um, <laughs> well, yep. It was from the livery company. That is, I don't, so the Bank of England directors were looking for a space that was large enough to conduct their business. And also many of the Bank of England directors were members of these livery companies. So they were used to coming together in these corporate bodies in those types of spaces. And so um, after 40 years in the grocer's hall, when the Bank of England directors went to construct their own building, they ended up constructing a classical version of a livery company. That is the relationship of the Paul to the suite of where the directors were. And so, and I think that this is actually very common. That is many uh, institutions uh, will start out in, uh, they'll adapt an existing building and then when, and they'll adapt themselves to it. And then when they construct and design their first purpose built structure, it's a variation of the types of spatial arrangements that they had occupied um, at first. So uh, that's how I see the Bank of England evolving spatially as a, its own internal social structural institution as an expansion and a regularization of that basic livery company organization. They're both the same. They're both corporate institutions run by uh, boards of directors that require large public space corporate uh, executive space, and then uh, intermediary administrative spaces. So a bank's not just the pay hall, right? It's all the other sites of governance and administration. Um, question. You were talking about the, these rights, but I was wondering whether there's a difference in the different stages of the architecture and how it then was perceived by the lower classes. Oh, by the lower classes? Yes. That's what you're asking? Um, yeah. Yeah, it's very hard to get a sense of that. I did try to read everything I could about people's perception of it. And in some ways, you... Um, uh, there were London guidebooks beginning in the mid 18th century mentioned things about the Bank of England. So in the mid 18th century, a guidebook talked about how the Bank of England was going to be expanding even before it was. And I think you pick up there, lower classes worrying about the building's expansion, which eventually happened. I think you get a sense of what people thought about it when they attack it. So uh, the Gordon riots, what people thought about its style there's never really much about that. But the building itself um, becoming a tourist attraction, I tried to learn about what people who worked in it thought about it. You only get some uh, indication of that um, in the early 20th century. Um, and so I think for evidence of popular perception of a building, you uh, can go to uh, tour books, or any kind of spectacular event that uh, might take place can give you a clue to it. But there's no documentary evidence of people talking about the building. But one can imagine that as the bank expanded and forcibly dislocated uh, people from where they lived and worked in the city of London and consolidated the city of London as a financial district, there's constant um, a discussion about those social issues. So then one can imagine that the Bank of England as the symbol for the financial and moneyed class would have um, um, been subject uh, to a certain degree of antagonism. But in terms of the particularities of the style, there's really not much about that uh, from a popular perspective. Okay. If there's no other questions, just uh, last round of applause for planning. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for coming today and uh, for your good questions.